Hello, everyone. I think we can start. Um, so, uh, welcome. Uh, let me first introduce myself. So, I'm uh, Maxime. I work at Bootlin. And I mainly work on uh, networking drivers. So, I've worked on uh, network Phi drivers and network Mac drivers, especially on PPV2, which is a, a controller for Marvel platforms. And during my, my work, uh, I have implemented support for classification in PPV2. So today I'm going to describe a bit what uh, classification is, uh, what uh, is already available in the kernel in terms of software classification, what operations we can offload to the hardware, why is it useful, and give you a quick example on how this is implemented really on the hardware side uh, inside a network controller. So, uh, yeah, um, nowadays this is something that we are starting to see more and more in the embedded world. Uh, classification and offloading classification is not something new. Uh, it has been around for a long time on the server world, so with big companies and manufacturers such as Mellanox or Intel. Uh, and this used to be done by a firmware, so this was completely hidden from the Linux world. Uh, today, we are starting to see some uh, components where we have to interact with this from the Linux side. So, uh, the goal of this talk is to yeah, see what kind of challenges we have to deal with uh, with these technologies. So, first of all, uh, let me first give you a quick uh, reminder of what classification is. Um, and I am going to focus on the ingress side of the traffic. So when we talk about uh, traffic, we have uh, either egress traffic, which is something that is going out uh, of the machine that we are uh, working on, and we have ingress traffic, which is inbound traffic. So we are going to focus on inbound traffic. Um, so a quick reminder, what happens uh, when we receive a packet uh, from the out outside world? Most of the time, we have a networking PHY. So the PHY is in charge of decoding the physical signals uh, that transport the information we want. It can be a fiber optics. It can be a copper cable. Uh, so the PHY will decode that and transmit it to the MAC, which is uh, most of the time located inside the system on the chip in embedded systems. It can also be in, uh, on PCI cards and so on. Um, in case of offloading, the offloaded operation, so uh, things that the hardware will do for us, uh, this is most of the time done before, uh, we, before the Mac transfers the packet uh, to the memory. So this is done before the DMA step uh, when receiving a packet. Uh, when the Mac is done uh, receiving the packet and copying it to memory, it will raise an interrupt to signal the CPU that we have an incoming packet that needs to be processed. Um, a quick zoom inside the Mac. So uh, in our case, we have a packet processor. So this is not on the schematic, but uh, this is uh, a part of the Mac that is dedicated to packet processing. So it will try to look inside uh, the headers of the packet and see if it can do some operation to uh, offload some things from the, the software world. And once uh, the packet is received, yeah, as I told, it's, it's placed in memory using DMA. And we have a mechanism uh, of receive queues, also called receive rings in some cases. Uh, on very simple uh, network controllers, we only have one receive queue. But on complex uh, controllers, we have multiple receive queues. And this can be useful because we can uh, pin some interrupts uh, to these receive queues. The main interest in our situation is that we can make sure that one given core of our CPU uh, will be processing packets from a given receive queue. So this will help us uh, spread the traffic uh, across all of our CPUs instead of only using one and using a software mechanisms to do the load balancing afterwards. So I'm going to, co to talk about this a bit later. Uh, there is a mechanism that is called uh, RSS that is useful in this uh, scenario. Um, once the packet uh, is arrived and we had uh, the interrupt, uh, the software world now takes control. So uh, we have a, an interrupt handler inside our driver. Um, 
most of the work is done in soft IRQ context uh, in networking. So uh, the hardware interrupt handler will try to do as little work as possible. It will just signal that we have an incoming packet that, is com that has come in. And then we have a mechanism uh, called NAPI that will do some interrupt coalescing. Um, the main idea is that when you receive one packet, most of the time you will receive uh, a bunch of them uh, in a row. So instead of having one interrupt that needs to be handled per incoming packet, uh, we group that together and use some polling mechanisms uh, to read these packets instead of uh, functioning in an interrupt-based scenario. So this helps with the processing throughput. Um, after that, we have a step that I will that will be the main focus, uh, which is the um, TC uh, subsystem uh, that allows us to perform some very specific action on our packet based on the content of the header. So the normal route without TC is to go through all the handlers for all of the protocols uh, that are present in our packet. So if you're familiar with the way a typical network packet is built, we have several layers that are encapsulated uh, within each other. Uh, the outermost layer uh, that we have to worry about is the layer 2. So uh, in our case, this is the Ethernet layer. In that layer, uh, we'll have information about uh, the MAC addresses and the VLANs, for example. So we have uh, generic handlers for that inside the kernel to deal with the VLANs and so on. Once we dealt with the layer 2, we can deal with the layer 3, which is uh, most of the time IPv4 or v6. We can do some routing here based on the IP addresses that are present in the header. And then we will deal with the layer four. Uh, the most common ones uh, are UDP and TCP. So we have information about the destination port and source ports. And uh, at that point, when we handle the layer four, we will try to associate the IP destination address and the IP destination port, uh, the TCP or UDP uh, destination port to a socket that was opened by user space. And from that point, we simply give the content, the content of the payload to user space, and user space will deal with all of the other layers uh, that uh, might be present in our payload. So the kernel only deals with layer two, three, and four uh, in the most common cases. So dealing with all of these layers, uh, this is great. We have a very generic uh, networking stack. If we want to do some very specific operations, such as dropping packets that are not interesting, um, relying on these helpers can uh, cost a lot in terms of CPU time. So we have a hook, which is the TC subsystem, which allows us to do some filtering uh, before going through all of this stack. Uh, and this is what we are trying to offload in our scenario. So uh, all of these uh, pre-processing steps before the layer 2, 3, 4 handling uh, can be offloaded to hardware. So to do that, we have to look at the content of our headers inside our packets. This is not an easy task because we have a lot of existing protocols and this makes so that uh, looking for a specific information is difficult because we cannot simply just look at an offset inside the array containing the bytes of our packets. Uh, an example is uh, when we have VLAN tags. VLAN tags will um, enlarge the size of the layer two uh, header, and it will therefore shift all of, the, all of the other headers by four bytes. So if we want to get the information uh, destination port for TCP, we first have to know do we have a VLAN tag or not before trying to look up for this operation, that, for this information. So um, this step of extracting all of the relevant information from the headers is called uh, dissecting the packet. Um, so yeah, here are several examples of various kind of packets. So we have all the three same protocols, oh, except for IPv6. But as you can see with just simple um, differences, uh, we have a very different layout of our packet. Um, so yeah, classification in our case is simply the operation of ident identifying the packets that we are interested in to, uh, to perform some operations such as dropping them very early on or rerouting them to another interface. 
um, most of the time we talk about uh, flows when we deal with classifications. So a flow, in our case, is a group of packets that share the same values for uh, some attributes. Uh, common flows are two tuples and five tuple flows. Uh, two tuple flows are um, groups of packets that share the same source and destination IP addresses. So packets that belong to the same flow will come to the same place and go to the same place. For five tuple, we've, we also look at the um, TCP and UDP ports, also the layer four protocol. So are we using TCP or UDP? And uh, packets that share the same five val values for these attributes will most likely go to the same socket to user space. So dealing with these flows is an easier way uh, to handle uh, traffic steering and controlling. So uh, we have two main interfaces to perform classifications from user space. Well, two main interfaces that allows from, for hardware offloading. There are several more. Uh, uh, the most powerful one is TC Flower. So TC, the, the tool TC is uh, used for traffic control. It's a very powerful tool that allows to uh, affect uh, both ingress traffic and egress traffic. It's used to limit uh, the, the rate for several flows, for example. So you can do very specific stuff, such as uh, limiting uh, the rate for uh, a given flow. So for example, you can prioritize traffic uh, with this tool. So make sure that, for example, the traffic that is going to your uh, web server is uh, handled uh, with a higher priority than all of, of other kind of traffic. And so with TC, you have a wide variety of uh, what we call filters. So filters are basically classifiers. Most of them have a software implementation. And the flower filter is special because it uh, allows having both software implementations and hardware implementations for the filters. So the TC flower uh, filter will decide by itself whether or not it will offload the rules to the hardware or do it in software. Uh, so this is an example of how to use the TC flower filter to perform a very simple case of classification that would be dropping all traffic uh, going to port 80 on the machine. Uh, yeah, but you can do some much, much more complex things with a kind of a build some kind of trees of uh, action and classifications. So you can group the traffic uh, with a filter and apply uh, actions on this group and then re-filter behind it and apply more specific case of, uh, of filtering. So TC is very, very powerful, but uh, the drawback is that it can be very difficult to express, express uh, such complex rules uh, when we want to offload something to the hardware. The main other interface is EastTool. So this tool is a tool that allows you to directly uh, interact with your networking driver. And with this tool, you can also express rules that you will uh, uh, want to be offloaded inside your controller. So with this tool, we, you can only do some hardware classification, uh, not software. Um, so you don't have a tree-based uh, structure here. You simply have a big table of rules and the most the, the uppermost uh, rule uh, will, only, uh, will always take precedence. Uh, there is ongoing work to have a third interface that supports hardware offloading, uh, which is NetFilter. So um, a big issue with these two interfaces, TC Flower and EastTool, is that both of these uh, rep representations were different when you were writing a networking driver. So you had a specific set of callbacks uh, for configuring um, TC Flower and another set for each tool. And you have to basically duplicate the work each time you wanted to support uh, each tool or TC Flower. Now, they wanted to uh, introduce a third way to offload the traffic classification with NetFilter. And they decided to unify uh, these internal representation into one, which is called the Flow World uh, Infrastructure. So yeah, uh, this is an ongoing work that is currently being uh, upstreamed. So soon you will be a, a third slide with NetFilter here. So why do we want to offload uh, the classifications? Uh, there are pros and cons. 
the pros, of course, is that you will reduce your CPU load. So instead of having your CPU unpack the headers uh, of your packet, look at the different attributes and decide uh, whether or not you should do something specific with this packet, uh, it takes some CPU time. Um, in embedded systems, uh, the, CPU power, the CPU is valuable and also uh, you have to keep in mind that we can deal with 10 gigabits uh, per second interfaces and the CPU will not be able to uh, perform classifications at that throughput. So in some cases, if you want to have what we call line rate, um, you have to offload most of the work to your hardware. Uh, as I said, this can be also useful to spread the traffic across the CPUs because uh, the, in, the CPU that uh, handles the first incoming interrupt will be the one doing all the work inside the kernel. So by default, this would be only one CPU if you only have one receive queue available. Uh, and you have to use classification to spread your traffic to all of your receive queues and all of your CPUs. So this is uh, an easy way to make use of all of your CPU cores. Uh, you can also do some switching uh, with that. So uh, you have some uh, infrastructure such as SwitchDev, uh, which uses these kinds of offloading to implement switching. Uh, yeah, so this is yeah, basically why you would use uh, hardware offloading, but there are some cons. Uh, the big issue is that if you decide to drop some traffic uh, inside your Mac, your kernel will never know that you had this packet incoming. So it will never see it. Uh, your counters will be off because uh, you, you won't have your counters up to date. Um, if you want to detect new flows in some cases, you have to make sure that the first packet of one flow uh, arrives to the CPU before deciding what you do with that flow, if you want to drop it or not. So yeah, you have to make sure that uh, you are okay with the fact that your system will be possibly missing some incoming packets and the information that you had something incoming. Um, so the hardware design for uh, this kind of packet processors um, is a bit similar of what you find in software. So first of all, you have to extract all the information of what is inside our header. Um, this is done by what we call the parser. So this is the equivalent of uh, the dissecting step in software. So the parser is a component inside your packet processor that will extract all of this information. As I said, this is not straightforward to do because you have to look inside each and every layer to detect the various offsets of the attributes that you are interested in. Uh, once you have parsed your packet, you can then use some classification engines to decide what you will do with it. Uh, you can have a policer. So the policer is in charge of limiting the traffic, uh, the, the throughput, if you want to. And then you have all the classic step of uh, doing your DMA transfer and that, uh, then queuing to your receive rings. Um, the parser is very interesting because you have to use a special kind of... Oh, a special kind of memory to do so. Uh, keep in mind that you want to be dealing with 10 gigabits per second traffic or higher. And to do so, uh, we use most of the time what we call a TCAM. So in the same way that you have some SRAM or DRAM, you have the TCAM, which is another kind of memory. Uh, this is a memory that is addressed by uh, value. And this is not a binary memory as you are used to. This is a ternary memory. So you will be matching some patterns inside uh, a key. So the key is simply uh, uh, some bytes that you will extract from your packet header. And you will try to match uh, some patterns inside that key. Uh, so what you can match is either a 0, a 1, or uh, what we call an x, which is whatever value. So this is why this is a ternary memory. You have 0, 1, or whatever. Um, once you have matched uh, something with your TCAM, so the TCAM uh, takes a lot of place on a uh, silicon die, so um, this is something that is very expensive to put on, side, uh, on the Mac, so you have a very limited uh, space here. Uh, once you have matched something, you can, the, the TCAM will return the index at which the, the match uh, was found. 
And this index is then used to perform a standard SRAM lookup inside another memory. And this will uh, contain all the attributes that are associated to this match. For example, if you want to detect whether or not you have a VLAN tag inside your L2 uh, header, you will match uh, the specific value for the ether type that corresponds to I have a VLAN tag. And you will associate to that match the information I have a VLAN tag. So this is a bit that you will simply flip to indicate, OK, I have a VLAN tag. So uh, in the parser, the TCAM SRAM um, uh, memory configuration is uh, something that you will iterate on for every packet. So you will have a first match that will uh, detect whether or not you have a VLAN tag. Then you will have a second match that will detect whether or not you are using IPv4 or IPv6 or something else. You will have other kind of matches to detect whether or not you are dealing with fragmented traffic or not. Then you will try to detect uh, whether or not you are using TCP or UDP. And as I said, uh, depending on the result of each match, uh, your header size uh, will change. Uh, so the offsets at which, at which you will find your next interesting attribute will depend on the result of the match. So at each match, you will update the offset for the next match. And in that way, you have a way to basically crawl through your header and each time accumulate new information on the content of the packet, only the header. So with this kind of iterating uh, thing, you can uh, dissect your packet uh, at 10 gigabits per second with these technologies. So this is very internal uh, to, your, uh, to your Mac. At that step, the software uh, implementation has not come in place yet. This all happens before the interrupt is fired. So then using this information, uh, the classifier will uh, use all of this to uh, detect what to do with the packet. So classifier, most of the time, uh, a hardware classifier will also have a lot of tables that you have to configure. Inside these tables, you will try to match some uh, specific information. So now that you have uh, identified uh, where we can find the TCP destination, TCP uh, source port, IP destination, IP source, you can build some keys in a reliable way, uh, regardless of uh, some specific details, such as whether or not we have a VLAN tag. So in the classification step, we will extract all of the relevant information and try to match them with some rules. So at that step, we will decide whether or not we are interested in traffic going to port 80, as I said previously, as an example. So you have several engines that uh, are used for classifications. Uh, you have engines that are based on TCAM technologies. So it is basically the same thing as the parser. You have engines that uh, use uh, hashing uh, mechanisms. So you will have, in that case, a fuzzy match, because since you use a hash of information from your header, you won't be 100% sure that this is the flow that you are interested into. But this can be interesting to do something such as uh, spreading traffic across all of the CPUs uh, with RSS. And then you can have uh, classification engines inside the hardware that have basically a small CPU uh, dedicated to classification uh, for that. So you will write rules with if, then, and else constructs. And then, based on the, all the results of the various engines, uh, you will decide what you will, in the end, do with your packet. Uh, do you drop it? Uh, do you forward it to the software? Uh, do you redirect it to another interface? So this is what we, tr we are trying to decide at that step. Um, let me just dig a bit deeper into the RSS thing. So RSS also is not new, but I consider it as a special case of hardware classification because we still need to extract information from our header. So um, RSS stands for Receive Side Scaling, and it allows us to spread the traffic across multiple CPUs. So we cannot simply say, OK, I have an, ingress uh, uh, an incoming packet. I will route that to CPU 0, then the next one to CPU 1, and the next one to CPU 2, and do a round robin kind of stuff. You cannot do that because uh, if the packets belong to the same flow, uh, you will end up with uh, packets that need to be processed by the same user space process, 
uh, being processed by a lot of various CPUs, and then you will have, in the end, to do some locking to make sure that all the packets are, in the end, uh, um, dealt with in the correct order uh, by user space. So what you do instead is that you extract information to, uh, to which flow the packet belongs to, and then you will uh, spread the traffic depending on this particular flow. So you will uh, associate an ident identifier uh, to any given flow using a hashing uh, function, and then based on this hash, you will uh, assign a receive ring to this packet. So this guarantees that all the packets from the same flows are always handled by the same CPUs. So you don't have any reordering issues uh, to worry about. Uh, your cache and locality issues are uh, dealt with. So this really makes for great, great uh, performance improvements for uh, routing, for example. So this is how you configure RSS. This is done with Eastool. Um, in PPV2, we find all of these uh, technologies. So, yeah, PPV2 was the base for uh, the architecture of the parsing and classifier stuff in these slides, but this is very similar in other networking uh, uh, controllers. Uh, in very high-end uh, controllers, this is the same technologies, but in a much bigger scale. So in PPV2, we have a TCAM parser that has 256 entries. So you can specify uh, 256 different matches for the headers. Uh, you have uh, 512 instructions for the classifications. And you have four different uh, classification engines. An interesting thing in that is that the C3 and C4 engines are so complex that we just cannot support them uh, with the restricted APIs that we, are, that we offer to user space. So uh, this is something that is uh, common. We have to limit what we do with our classifier uh, because this is a very generic way of doing things and this is too, too powerful to be, uh, to be entirely under the control of user space for now. Um, so yeah, in our situation with PPV2, we can do pretty much everything. So we can drop the traffic at this stage. We can uh, redirect it to other interfaces. We can uh, choose to which uh, receive queue the flow will go to. And we can also, uh, so what I call steering to RSS table means that uh, you can target a specific flow and spread it to a lot of CPUs. So in that case, you will be doing that with two tuple flows. So uh, you can say, uh, OK, uh, all of the traffic the, towards a given IP address will be handled by all of the CPUs, and all of the rest will be handled by only one. So you can priori prioritize things. Um, one uh, drawback is that all of these resources um, is shared between all of, physical, uh, all of the physical parts on the machine. So. Uh, when you are doing some TC or if tool configuration, you are specifying to which interface this applies to. And in our case, we have to manually uh, separate all of these uh, flows uh, between the different uh, interfaces, physical interfaces, inside the driver. Because all of these resources, the TCAM and the classifier, takes so much place that it, it's only present once on the die. And you have to make sure that when you specify a rule on a given port, it won't drop traffic on the other interfaces. This can be problematic. So in PPV2, we support RSS. We support steering on two and five tuples. We also support steering on the VLAN tag. So this allows us to perform um, quality of service uh, uh, classification. So we can uh, prioritize one VLAN over others, for example making sure that traffic uh, to destined to one VLAN will be handled on all CPUs and all of the rest on simply one. Um, we have MAC and VLAN filtering. So this is the step of uh, where we detect uh, whether or not the VLAN tag that is present in the packet is uh, interesting for us or not. So if we receive a packet that, don't, that uh, doesn't have the correct uh, destination MAC address, you would normally drop it because it's not interesting for us. Uh, if this is done in software, this is a loss of CPU time, so we can do it in hardware. 
Uh, same goes for the VLAN tag. Uh, and there are no firmware involved for all of these configurations. So this is all done in the driver. So if you want to see how you configure a TCAM, you can have a look at the PPV2 driver. And as I said, we only use two of the engines because the other ones are way too complex uh, to implement. So hopefully you learned a thing or two. Uh, you have to take into account a lot of things when you do some classification of loading. Uh, most, the most obvious thing is that uh, in, your, in, in this situation, the hardware will be doing stuff behind the CPU's back. So if you have a bug or if you have a misconfiguration, it can be very hard to troubleshoot. Uh, there are ongoing efforts to try to report all of the statistics um, that the hardware reports uh, to user space. So there are discussions about that. Uh, most of the time, the performance improvement makes it worth it, especially in the embedded world. Uh, yeah, and we are starting to see uh, interesting stuff where this is not done by a firmware. So in my opinion, this is a big win. So if you have any questions on that, uh, I'll be happy to answer. Yes. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, you mentioned there are several user space interfaces to do or to configure the filtering. Um, is these all handled by one and the same callback in the driver, or do you have to implement several callbacks? So nowadays you have to implement several callbacks. So you have the TC hooks, you have the ESTool hooks, uh, and the, this is tricky because uh, you have to either ignore the fact that you have uh, different sets of callbacks in your driver and assume that your user will be only using one set of them uh, because you can have contradictory rules uh, that are given by TC and ESTool. So for now, this is something that is being worked on with the Flower infrastructure work, and hopefully one day this will be a unified interface. But this is done by the infrastructure in the kernel. Hmm? The Sorry. cleanup of, of everything is... Uh being worked on is in the infrastructure of the kernel, not part of your driver. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. For now, we have to deal with uh, several, uh, several sets of callbacks. Thank you. Any other question? No. In that case, I will ask a beginner's question. Um, if I use VMware or other virtualization, I often end up with promiscuous interfaces. Could that help? If you use, sorry? Uh, bridged into VM. Yeah. Could this technology help to not end up with a promiscuous Ethernet interface on the host? Uh, so there are ways to use classification of loading uh, where you have some VMs without using promiscuous mode uh, with uh, Viatio and so on. So. I'll follow up on that question. Um, if you have like these uh, DSA switches mm -hmm. and you configure them in bridged mode, then the CPU interface ends up uh, in promiscuous mode. And that's not very nice. Could that be somehow fixed by the classification maybe on the CPU interface side? Uh, so I don't know in that case for switches. I well, the problem is the, the Linux bridge code, which uh, switches the CPU interface into promisc mode. Yeah, well, I don't know what to answer. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you for your talk. It was really, really interesting. And uh, I wanted to ask about uh, the question about uh, hardware counters, you know, mm -hmm. because uh, packets that are uh, filtered out on, on a hardware level, that you, you can never see them. Is there any standardized way how to access this sort of information hardware? I mean, is, is, is there currently information in hardware about that, and is there some, some standardized way to access it? So for now, what you do is you use ESTool to, uh, to ask your network driver to uh, interrogate the hardware about the control values. So this is the interface that you have to use now, uh, and this is not always implemented by your driver. So 
yeah, as I said, there is an ongoing, ongoing work to try to unify that, uh, especially with the if tool using Netlink now. Uh, this will uh, simplify a lot of stuff. So, yeah, this is something being worked on uh, because this can be yeah, it, it's not helpful to troubleshoot if you cannot see even the, that packets have, have arrived. Thank you. Well, I think we are out of time anyway, so <laughs> thank you.